Another federal appeals court strikes a blow against the bump stock ban. Plus, a conversation with scholar David Copel on the political and legal future of assault weapons bans. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. No, the devil's got no hold on me. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gatowski. I'm also the founder of TheReload.com, where you can head over and sign up for our free weekly newsletter if you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America. And you can also buy a membership if you want to get exclusive access to hundreds of pieces of reporting and analysis that you won't find anywhere else and get access to this podcast a day early, as well as the opportunity to appear on the show in a member segment. So uh, I think it's a pretty good deal and it helps us. That's how we sustain our reporting. So if you like the reporting we do, there's one way you can directly support us. Uh, This week, we are going to talk about AR-15s and uh, so-called assault weapons bans and um, some of the developments in the states recently on that end and in the courts as well. And we have a special guest with us, uh, Dave Copel from the Independence Institute in Colorado, uh, where there was a recent attempt to pass one of these. So we'll get some insight into that. But welcome to the show, Dave. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Can you just tell people a little bit more about yourself uh, for anyone who hasn't heard of you before? Sure. Um, I am the research director at the second oldest state level think tank in the United States, the Independence Institute, um, where we are founded on the eternal truths of the Declaration of Independence. I'm also an adjunct scholar at the the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. I've been affiliated with them since 1988. Um, which makes me one of the very most senior people at Cato, um, although not one of the best paid since it's an un- unpaid job. Um, <laughs> and I'm all, uh, I am an adjunct uh, constitutional law professor at Denver University uh, since uh, 2010, and I am a senior fellow at the University of Wyoming College of Law Firearms Research Center. And you've uh, written a number of amicus briefs for the Supreme Court and other other federal courts over the years as well, right? I've uh, written many, many, many briefs um, uh, in uh, Helen McDonald and, and Bruin, of course, but lots, lots and lots uh, besides that and, and 20 books and uh, currently on my 119th scholarly article. And you can get it all for free at my website, davecopel.org, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L. Wonderful. So you are um, <clears throat> well versed in this topic, certainly, and you also happen to be on the ground in Colorado, where the we we saw this issue of assault weapons bans uh, come to a head <clears throat> just recently. Obviously, there have been a number of states have been sort of a resurgence of this policy over the last couple of years. You saw. Delaware adopt one, Illinois, and now Washington State uh, for the first time in, uh, there's really like a 20-year gap between when these policies were adopted, because initially it was back in the the late 90s, you saw a string of states adopting them, and the federal government adopted one as well, Uh, and then there really weren't any for a long time, and now we're seeing uh, seeing these come up again in sort of the post-Bruin world, which is fascinating. But in Colorado, uh, at the same time, you saw a couple of blue states reject this, Colorado being among them. There was also New Mexico, Michigan. What what was this, the uh, from your estimation, from following this, this process, what were the reasons in Colorado why this didn't uh, take hold? Uh, the, the biggest reason, I'd say, was Governor Polis, our, uh, who's in his, uh, a Democrat who's in his second term, as a as governor didn't want it, and uh, Jared Polis is a, you know, he would definitely call himself a progressive Democrat. He's certainly to the left of the political center, but he has a libertarian ish streak sometimes. And because of the catastrophic ineptitude uh, of of the Colorado Republican Party, um, Jared Polis is the most conservative statewide elected official. Uh, in, in Colorado right now. Um, and he made it clear he didn't want to do this. And he gave the the gun prevention people lots of other things they could do, which, which he will sign. Um, and so that was, and he's been doing that for a while, but that's, he, he's the reason why there's no assault, assault weapon, so-called ban in Colorado right now. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess we should uh, get into real quick, you know, assault weapon. The term yeah. itself is is a very nebulous term, right? There's it really varies what it means depending on what state you look at or what policy is being proposed. Um, usually it's, you know, there's obvious, there's obvious targets of these sorts of, of, of laws, which are, you know, AR-15, uh, AK-47s, but they, they obviously go well beyond that and try to sort of capture a number of firearms based on really, I guess, cosmetic features, right? That's, that's the common critique, at least of these policies. Well, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the, the features are, are important and not merely, I mean, the, the fact that a gun is black rather than brown, that would, that would be cosmetic. Uh, but uh, the, the features they want to ban are all things that, that make guns safer and more accurate. But there, there, there's a broader point to this. And you know, I've been obviously in, involved in the, the Second Amendment issue since 1989. Um, and as I detail in an article in the uh, a few years ago in, in the uh, the Penn Regulatory Review from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. If you look at the uh, ban assault weapon bills over the years, uh, there is no consistency between them. In fact, literally every type of firearm and actually a lot of air guns have been described as assault weapons in various bills that are produced. So it is a meaningless epithet and its only purpose is to ban as many guns as possible uh, based on the political circumstances of, of any particular uh, jurisdiction at the time. Hmm. So what did, what did the Colorado proposal uh, look to ban? Well, uh, one of the things they would ban is any gun that has a threaded barrel. Um, and as you know, a threaded barrel is used to attach, uh, most of all, a sound suppressor. Um, which is great for for everybody. Uh, I mean, they're obviously highly regulated. It takes a uh, two hundred dollar tax and, and months of paperwork from the uh, ATF to buy one. But once you get one, um, it reduces uh, the sound of a firearm by about thirty decibels. So if you're looking at say a, a standard nine millimeter handgun, that takes it down from about one hundred and sixty, which is the level of an airplane engine all the way down to 130, which is the level of a jackhammer. And that is quieter. It doesn't make it silent at all. So the word silencer is a, a real misnomer. Uh, but it does, it helps to protect hearing. You'd still want to have hearing protection on top of having a, a, a sound suppressor. And it's also better, you know, for everybody else, because then there's less uh, noise escaping, say, from a shooting range which, you know, sometimes bother the people who decided to build a house next to a shooting range and sure. then are all surprised when it, it it's get, gets loud there sometimes. Right. So, I mean, threaded barrels can be used for lots of stuff, other stuff, they, too, right. flash they, they, can be used, and, they can be used for a muzzle brake, yeah. uh, to re, which reduces recoil and makes the gun more, more controllable. Um, and they can be used for uh, a flash suppressor, which somewhat reduces recoil and also uh, reduces night blindness if you're say you have to use your firearm against a home invader at, at night, uh, the flash suppressor re reduces the risk that when you shoot, you'll you'll be temporarily blinded by, by the flash of light. So the interesting thing about the bill is it said, oh well, flash suppressors are bad. So if you got a gun with a flash suppressor, that makes it an assault weapon. But it didn't have anything about silencers, suppressors, or or muzzle brakes, all of which are, are perfectly legal in Colorado. But yet through either incompetent or malicious drafting, or maybe both, um, by outlawing threaded barrels, of course, it would have outlawed uh, having suppressors, which, of course, many people in Colorado do just like they do almost everywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, most of these, while they differ, and especially the ones that have been in place in areas like California, for instance, or Massachusetts, have really changed over time from what they started as. It seems there's a fairly common, you know, denominator, a fairly common starting point for most of these bills, which is, uh, you know, they seek they first off, they name a bunch of guns by, you know, their actual uh, commercial titles. A lot of guns, which still which don't, aren't even sold anymore because uh, these lists come yeah. from like the 1990s. Right. But uh, and then from there, they'll go to centerfire guns that accept attachable magazines and then have either one or two of these banned features like the threaded barrel or flash suppressor or pistol grip 
uh, telescoping stock, you know, those uh, barrel shrouds is another one that's commonly in there. Is yeah. that what the Colorado law, you know, sort of conform to that? And I think in recent years, they've really focused on, it used to be two features. You could have at least one of these features. And now, right, now, now it's one, that's down. just the politics of it. I mean, they yeah. obviously, which makes it way more expansive, right? And yeah, in practice. And the, the, the point of this is it's a starting point to ban all guns. You know, I mean, uh, former U.S. Representative Gabby Giffords uh, was just quoted in, in Time magazine today uh, saying she wants to ban all guns. And so banning so-called assault weapons is, in, in their view, a good first step in, in that direction. Uh, the, the Colorado bill did not have a, a list of guns by name, um, which is kind of ridiculous to have at all, because if there's whatever characteristics make a, a gun supposedly bad, uh, you ought to be able to describe those characteristics uh, just straightforwardly and, and, and say those. And so the Colorado bill, to its credit, did that rather than, than having the list. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, obviously, the proponents of these bills or gun control advocates generally claim that, you know, they'll say that they don't want to ban all guns. They just want to ban these ones because they find them particularly dangerous or they're used and uh, they, they show up in high profile mass shootings. Um, you know, and you, you're saying you don't believe, essentially you don't believe what they're, uh, what they say publicly. And you think, no, that no, is... no, of course not. And they're okay. well, in, in Colorado, they're not so much saying that anymore. We have a, we now have a, so a gun violence prevention caucus. They, they call themselves, although, they could just make it simpler by saying, calling it gun prevention. And when I see these these people uh, introducing their bills in the legislature, they're never uh, saying, "Oh, I'm this is just I respect the Second Amendment. People have a right to arms for self defense and, and for re recreation." And so we're just having these, you know, this particular narrow control to deal with that. Now they they open up with saying how bad guns are in general, uh, how terrible it is that more people are buying guns, and never have a, a decent word to say about guns or gun ownership at all. Now, they do have some dupes who come in, you know, the the so the people they get, like the Giffords organization, uh, does a good job of, of collecting useful idiots uh, among gun owners who don't realize that they're working for a gun ban organization. Um, and they'll come in and sometimes say, oh, you know, nobody needs an assault weapon. Uh, I use a shotgun for self-defense and that's, that's good enough for me. You know, and, and that may be fine for that particular guy because you're some, you know, big full-sized adult male. Uh, you can probably, you can handle a 12 gauge shotgun pretty well, but that's not everybody is in that situation. But the, uh, no, the only, the only people, uh, no, the, the Colorado uh, gun ban lobby and its allied legislators uh, have kind of dropped the mask of claiming that they're not, not in favor of prohibition as their ultimate goal. Hmm. Okay. So uh, I, mean, I guess they won't, you... they won't say that out loud, but they'll never say anything in favor of right. gun ownership. Right. And uh, okay. So, you, so you question their ulterior motives, I suppose, for, for all of these policies. And, you know, and, and I don't think that's yeah. an uncommon position in the gun rights uh, movement, frankly, to think yeah. that that's the case. But um, uh, and then even beyond that, you know, you, you view these kinds of bans as, as sort of getting at what they have the most likely chance of achieving rather than trying yeah. to ban all guns. That's that's where you see the other side on this. Yeah. And then within the parameters of, of what they believe in that, that's a a smart strategic move for them right now. If they tried to ban all guns, um, courts would hold that unconstitutional. But if they ban only many millions of guns, um, you know, they've got a, a fighting chance in courts. Okay. And uh, and so getting back to the specifics of this Colorado uh, dynamic with the recent assault weapons ban attempt, obviously that you know, this went through the legislature, it got paired back and paired back. No, uh, it, ultimately it did not get paired back. It got what what got introduced was the the, the uh, basically the same thing that, <clears throat> that had been leaked in January and mm -hmm. then was introduced uh, a number of weeks later. It was the the full strength ban. It was not a it was not a possession ban. It was a sales and transfer ban. Right. But it, it's its scope never changed. I thought they tried to pair it back at the end to like just a bump stock ban. <laughs> well, so the, there's the, the story on that. So the legislator who sponsored it. 
um, was a, a very ineffective legislator and not highly regarded within the Democratic caucus by some fellow Democrats. Um, at the start of the all day hearing, you know, which, which began at 11.30 a.m. And, and wrapped up at 1 a.m. the next day, you know, 9.30 to 1 a.m., um, had said when she was introducing the bill that she would uh, be coming back that afternoon around 1 p.m. with something to cut it down to what she called a bump stock ban. Um, but in fact, that she didn't get that done uh, till much later in the night. And it was a, a, a you know, and it was a, as usual, it was this bait and switch that the gun ban people uh, try to pull on on everything. Um, and bump stocks is one of them. If, if you wanted to ban bump stocks, um, the Denver City Council did that, and they have a good definition of, of what a, a bump stock is, and you can't have one in, in Denver now. But this, they also ban things, anything that makes the trigger operate faster. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what they're thinking of is things, one thing that they would tell you about would be things like a forced reset trigger yeah. or, or a binary trigger. Right. But in addition, uh, it's written so broadly that if you buy a gun with a, a six pound trigger trigger pull and you want to re uh, replace that with a, a spring, so you have a five pound trigger pull, that would be illegal. But right. anyway, when she she introduced that language very late at night um, to the exhausted committee, uh, they ended up voting it down. Yeah, um, right. So it didn't. It was introduced. It languished. It got to this hearing. It wasn't going to pass as this full so up in sales ban. They tried to move it to this sort of bump stock slash uh, really any trigger modification. Any, any trigger ban. improvement would be illegal. Uh, and then that failed. And, yeah. and and you're saying that this was mainly because the governor didn't want this legislation to go through. So it, so it sounds like they're is uh, there are sort of they ran into a political constraint in in that policies um perhaps not interested in this policy for a couple of reasons one of them maybe that he wants to be president someday and and this is uh maybe it, it, that is interesting because certainly democrats have really embraced this policy uh increasingly over the last you know uh, five to ten years and especially the last few years with president biden taking perhaps the most aggressive uh, approach to supporting us always. It's basically what he calls for every, every couple of weeks. Right. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see uh, the governor of Colorado backing away from that. Um, but, but, uh, but I want to also talk about, or I, one of the things I'm wondering in this situation is in addition to those political costs, uh, or political calculation at play in Colorado on this, is there a calculation that, hey, this law is not likely to stand up in court anyway? And so why why go and uh, pass one right now? Oh, from the governor's point of view? Um, well, just from like legislators and, and the governor's point of view, do you think that's part of the reason that it failed in Colorado? I, I, I think more of the problem, at least for the, uh, the votes in committee, uh, was that, you know, the Democrats have a super majority in the Colorado mm -hmm. House. Uh, but one of the reasons they, they got that supermajority is they won uh, a lot of races in places that uh, in the past had, had uh, not traditionally elected Democrats. And part of the ways uh, they had campaigned was to say, I'm in favor of all the existing gun control laws in Colorado and maybe some additional ones, but I'm not going to ban guns. And so some of them had set up that kind of red line uh, for themselves. Okay. So there, so it wasn't just the governor then. There, there's also other Democrats in the state house that were opposed to this policy as well. And, and, and happily so, and especially when they, they didn't have to cross the governor uh, to stick by that. I see. Uh, I that see. made it that all easier. Sense. And, and adding on top of it, the absolute, uh, terribleness of, of the sponsor of the bill, who's uh, an, an, a hardcore, narcissistic, extreme leftist, uh, who's spent a lot of time in the legislature trashing her fellow Democratic colleagues for not being uh, as socialist as she is. 
Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, you know, because uh, thinking back to the Virginia uh, attempt a couple of years ago in 2020, when Democrats had total control here, uh, that was also seemed to be part of the equation as well. It was sponsored by somebody who's actually not even in the state house anymore. They got they lost in a primary, um, but yeah, they were they were very uh, far left and very aggressive legislator who um, was didn't seem was very well liked by at least some of their Senate Democratic colleagues who were the more moderate uh, wing at the time and were the ones that were responsible for blocking the, these bans. I think there is sort of a, there's also like this dichotomy between, it, it's much more popular to limit who has access to firearms uh, and institute policies to that end, like universal background checks or even red flag laws, than it is to ban wholesale types of guns, right? The hardware bans are, are harder to achieve on a political level too. Do you think that plays a role? I, I think it does. And that's one of the ways this issue has has really changed over the years. When it, when it came out as a national issue in 1989, there were a lot of uh, useful idiot gun owners uh, at first who supported it because they bought this line as, oh, it's just a bunch of, you know, it's a few weird guns. You know, that's all they're trying to do. This is no real threat to gun ownership in, in general. Um, and that that's obviously changed. One of the ways that changed was, you know, right from the start, uh, the the gun ban lobby, uh, after rolling this thing out as, oh, you know, we're, we're just going after Kalashnikovs and, you know, European guns, uh, you know, like Sig Sauer rifles and things most people don't even own. Um, but then, they, then when they get around to drafting the bill, it's like, oh, we're going to outlaw like the, the Ruger 1022 rifle. Uh, so people got the the sense that this is it was actually much broader than it had been sold as, and now of course uh, the the bans go even further, and in the meantime, um, some of the guns they're trying to ban have become extremely popular. I mean, one one out of five guns sold in the United States today is an AR rifle. You know, I mean, the AR right. rifle was around since the I, I think in 1964. Um, mm -hmm. but for civilian sale. Yeah. 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 But did not become, uh, popular and or nearly as popular, uh, as it is now until much later. Mm -hmm. Right. Probably until the original ban expired, right? It's become much more popular. Well, remember the original, the, the federal ban didn't really ban things. Um, it banned features. Right. And so you could, you could absolutely buy an AR rifle in 1997. It would just, you know, it, you couldn't have a bayonet lug on it. Um, you, you couldn't have a, a telescoping stock so that a short person and a tall person can share the same gun. So the, mm -hmm. the manufacturers had to remove features, but the, the mechanics of the guns uh, internally that sure. have always been the same. Right. I mean, that's always been one of the big critiques of these sorts of laws is that. Um, well, yeah, I know that you quibble with the term cosmetic because some of these features are useful but they don't yeah. change the the mechanics of the gun they don't change right. the caliber that it fires they don't change right. the rate that it shoots at any of that stuff and that's why people tend to refer to these as cosmetic bands but but uh but yeah i do get your point certainly they are uh you know the, the telescoping stock is not necessarily a cosmetic feature it's a right. ergonomics feature right. but um but yeah uh, so just circling back real quick to the legal aspect of this um, it, it sounds like you don't think that the threat of lawsuits, of successful lawsuits against these laws was a determining factor. Uh, actually, one thing I, I wonder is, do you think that's part of the resurgence of popularity of these, not popularity, but the resurgence of uh, blue states passing assault weapons bans is maybe partially because there's a, a sort of a realization that these laws aren't going to be around much longer. And so there's a lower uh, perhaps cost to passing these because they never actually go into effect, at least for not, not for very long. I think that, that that's too much of a, or is that, yeah. Is that 4D chess uh, too much of that? Yeah, no, there's a, some people have said, in, at least in the Colorado legislature, uh, the, the constitution doesn't count on second reading and uh, legislators take an oath to, 
uh, uphold the Colorado Constitution and the United States Constitution. And there are some who are conscientious about that. Uh, but the vast majority, uh, if there's something they want to do, um, they'll get a memo from the Legislative Council that says, well, courts generally defer to the legislature, so there's a good chance it'll be upheld. Uh, and that's good enough for, for them to, uh, to vote for something. Mm. Okay. And remember, they, a, they, they, a lot of them think the Constitution is wrong. You know, they said the Constitution was written a long time ago. It was written by other people. They were white. Uh, they were they were male. Uh, so nothing they do is is legitimate. Or they think that that's that the, these laws are still constitutional or what have you. Obviously, uh, obviously yeah. not so, not an area where you agree because you've been uh, writing on this topic for quite right. a long time now. And uh, let's get into that side of this. The, the actual legal side of these sure. laws. So yeah. we now have three new ones. Um, they've been they've all been challenged to varying degrees of success at this point. You still have the California law in uh, active litigation. That's actually right. we're probably going to get some uh, ruling there soon at the district court level. Um, you have the Supreme Court remanding the Maryland assault weapons ban case. We're probably going to presumably get a ruling in that sometime in the relatively near future. Where do you see things uh, in terms of fighting these AR-15 bans uh, right now? What's the legal landscape look like? Well, the, the legal landscape looks swell uh, to the extent that lower courts follow what Supreme Court precedent says. But that is uh, there's no guarantee on that one. Sometimes that happens and sometimes it don't. Uh, it doesn't. And the the gun ban lobbies, you know, mainly uh, Bloomberg's Every Town and uh, the, the Giffords organization, which also has lots of support from the ultra rich, uh, they have an enormous amount of money and they, they hire lots of really good lawyers who come up with, I, I think, ridiculous arguments to try to evade what the Supreme Court said. But, you know, they're they're well presented in the briefs. And some judges who are inclined to, to go in that direction uh, follow follow that. And of, of course, and then you, you layer on top of that the, the whole disinformation campaign uh, waged by the gun ban lobbies about that that the AR rifle bullet, either the two two three two two three is what they would say, or obviously it's also for five five six millimeter, uh, is some uniquely destructive thing that liquefies organs. And, and stuff like that. And of course, that, that's a complete lie. Uh, but they, you know, you get that out there in the media, then a judge can cite an article in a magazine uh, that said that, even though it's, it's completely false. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, you know, uh, rifles in general are much more powerful than handguns. Um, but within the class of centerfire rifles, uh, most AR type rifles are at the lower end uh, of power uh, right. because their bullets are so small. Yeah, muzzle energy is is lower for for yeah. most uh, two two three five five six rifles than it is for you know thirty out six or, or just about everything you, else. Other basically, than a, yeah, other than a twenty two, other than twenty two, right? So, um, but but uh, you know we're in this post Bruin era now. Uh, yeah. The Supreme Court has set out a new standard for how lower courts are meant to decide Second Amendment cases. Um, you know, this is one of the highest profile sections of that particular area of law. We have seen rulings in uh, Delaware, for instance, they had the district court just recently, um, uh, you know, just uh, ruled against a request for a preliminary injunction right. against uh, their assault weapons ban. And he, he used a, a logic that I think is becoming more popular for uh, judges who wish to uphold certain kinds of hardware bans under yeah. the Bruin standard. Uh, you know, the, can you just go through what and explain for the audience what the logic was was in this case and and your thoughts on it? Sure. And the there's a tendency among pro-constitution lawyers um, and the, on Second Amendment issues and, and on other things to think that the being right under constitutional law is all you need to do to win a case. Uh, but it's, it's, that's, that's not often the situation. So 
you can come into court and say, you know, look, uh, the Heller case said you can't ban arms that are in common use, arms that are typically used by lawful, by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes such as self-defense. And then all you got to do is show that the uh, banned guns are common, which these days is quite easy to do. Right. Um, and and therefore, therefore, that's the end of the case. And we and we should win and give us a preliminary injunction right now. Um, but the so in Delaware, that's basically what they did. Mm -hmm. And um, at the preliminary injunction stage, introduced no evidence, no you know, declarations, things like that by by experts, because like, why should we have to? Because what I just said is both necessary and sufficient for us to win. Well, the other side comes in and they do have these declarations and they, you know, from purported experts, uh, including these outrageous falsehoods uh, about the AR supposedly being used in most uh, mass shootings and about uh, and about how super powerful uh, the 223 round is, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from the point of view of a judge who's no expert on guns necessarily. Gun, you know, if you like, if you like being a generalist in law uh, and all kinds of different law, being a, a federal judge is, is great because you see all kinds of cases. And so this judge, uh, seeing on the one hand no evidence from the plaintiffs, and seeing from the the state government these declarations talking about liquefying organs and things like that, uh, most judges are got to be judges because they're very much color within the lines kind of people their whole career. Um, mm -hmm. You know, John Roberts is the, the platonic ideal of that. Uh, and this is not an ideological thing, um, but I'm saying they're by character and, and practice, they tend to be prudent and, and careful people, regardless of their uh, ideological views on law. Sure. So, you know, imagine a person like that and you got one person coming in saying, oh, here's our verbal formulation. This is why we win. And the other person says, well, uh, on the other hand, uh, you really want to go, you know, these super powerful guns that, that liquefy organs. Mm. You can understand why the judge at that level uh, says, well, not having any evidence going the other way. At this stage, I'm not going to give you the extraordinary remedy of a preliminary injunction. Mm -hmm. which is basically saying you're very likely to, you know, after we have the trial and all the evidence comes in and the cross-examination and all that, then, and, and I've had a chance to do some fact finding, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll see things differently, but at this point with no evidence on one side and horrifying supposed evidence on the other, I'm not going to give you guys the preliminary remedy uh, of uh, saying this law can't go into effect. Interesting. And the 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 rationale the ju the judge in Delaware used is that the the Bruin case does in many situations in, instruct uh, you know if, if the gun controls you can uphold are the ones that you can analogize to the mainstream historic tradition of American gun control which is especially things that come closer to the founding. Uh, right. As, and, and you don't have to, a law doesn't have to be a twin of something historical. It, it, it can be analogized. And, right, especially and, if there's some sort of unique modern problem derived from modern firearms technology. Right? Exactly. That's, the, that's what a lot of you've seen. You've seen this over and over again to this, like, right. organs. You know, like, yeah. The federal judge in Oregon's uh, magazine ban case used very similar logic to the Delaware assault weapons ban case. Judge. Exactly, and, and you can be more. And, and Bruin says you can be more nuanced mm -hmm. uh, when you're dealing with with new technologies. Right. Um, so why, uh, you know, and then they point to sort of a number of different laws that dealt with restri restricting firearms. Um, yeah, especially you know Bowie knife bans and things right. of that nature. You've written a lot about this. Why? Why is this logic not correct in your view? Like, what? What? Where is well, the where are these judges going wrong? So, if, if you're going for the uh, historical 
analogies. Um, I've got an article I, I co-wrote with my, my friend Joseph Greenlee uh, that will be published in Notre Dame Law School's Journal of Legislation um, in 2024, but it's available on my website right now in, in its draft form. Again, davecopel.org will be on the homepage and soon should be on ssrn.com, which is a great repository for all kinds of scholarship. Um, and so we looked at the history of in America from the Jamestown settlement in 1607 up through 1899, which is the point at which Heller said, uh, or Bruin said, you know, the stuff after that is really not very informative about the original meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, and because Bruin's historical point was, yes, yeah, some laws can be informative about the meaning of the Second Amendment, especially when they come early. So mm -hmm. the, the a minority of states uh, starting the 1810s had concealed carry bans. And from that, Bruin says this shows that the legislature can regulate the mode of carry. You know, you can require open carry or require concealed carry, but you, you can't ban both. So looking at the history of arms bans up to up to 1900, uh, the Bowie knife is certainly the thing that gets the most attention. Uh, starting in, especially in 1836, when in the, in the Arkansas legislature, the Speaker of the House and a, another legislator start insulting each other, uh, have an argument, and then they both draw Bowie knives and get into a fight and one kills the other. You know, and that was a, a, you know, an atrocious thing. And there was, I think, also a problem of uh, people carrying knives or, or other weapons, uh, you know, for, a, uh, for offensive purposes uh, rather than legitimate defense. But the, the long story of, of Bowie knives in America is that bans, sales bans on them uh, were quite rare. Uh, as were possession bans. Um, and the, the mainstream approach of regulation was to say, you can't carry it concealed. Um, if you want to sell it to a, uh, don't sell it to a minor at all, or don't sell it to a minor without, unless there's parental permission. And if you use it in a crime, uh, you're in extra trouble for using that. Mm. And that and that's the approach that got applied to a lot of other uh, controversial weapons as well. Right, and in fact, clubs and all, all this other stuff. Right, right. And the um, pistols sometimes as well, right? Uh, this starts with Georgia in 1836, where they, they banned the sale of most handguns other than the horse pistols, which are huge things that you, you'd wear on saddlebags on a horse, but are pretty big for carrying around when you're not mounted. Um, and and Bowie knives and dirks and other other. Right. Uh, there's not that's another time but of these night. weren't but like you're saying these weren't sales bans like an assault weapons ban is well it, it was it was certainly a, it was a sales ban on, on on those things i just mentioned okay. um but then the georgia supreme court in 1845 held that all that was unconstitutional uh, okay, uh, because it violated the second amendment and said the only part of this that's constitutional is the concealed carry ban which is fine but not not the sales ban not you know not the open carry ban uh and not the not the possession bans and notably, the U.S. Supreme Court in the Heller decision uh, treats this 1845 Georgia case, Nunn versus State, as perfectly capturing, said the U.S. Supreme Court, the relationship between the first and second clauses of the Second Amendment, and Nunn gets extolled more than any other uh, case precedent by mm -hmm. the Heller decision. So it's fairly, you know, that's fairly powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then... Well, let's we'll wrap up on the, the gun bans. The only thing you've got after that as actual bans on types of guns is Tennessee in 1879 and uh, Arkansas in 1881 banned the sale of guns other than the Army and Navy type, uh, ban the sale of handguns other than Army and Navy type revolvers. Uh, the Army and Navy type are, you know, as, as the name indicates, they're, they're big revolvers. Uh, that officers or artillerymen or, or cavalrymen uh, would 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 have as a sidearm, um, 
you know, they're, they're the most powerful handguns in existence. Uh, but because they're big, they're hard to conceal. And those states both ban concealed carry. Um, and the, the courts there in the Tennessee and Arkansas uphold that and say, yeah, under our state right to arms, you've got a right to militia type arms only. And these these are militia type arms, but not like a but not a little pocket pistol uh, like a Derringer you'd carry around in your pocket. And so that's it for handgun bans. One that was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment and two others that banned small concealable guns while affirming the right to own the largest and most powerful guns. And the gun ban lobbies say, oh, so look, look at Tennessee and Arkansas. Those are our precedents for banning the, you know, banning most modern centerfire rifles, supposedly. That, that's our analogy. And then the one thing you'd add on to that, in 1893, um, after a series of incidents where black people uh, used repeating rifles to protect themselves against lynch mobs, uh, the Florida legislature enacted a law saying you can only have a repeating rifle uh, on your person if you get a license from the county commissioners and the license fee is $100, which was a lot of money then. And then in, in 1901, they added uh, handguns to that. And as a uh, the Florida Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, Buford later wrote in a, in a case involving that, he said that it's obviously a violation of the Second Amendment and of the Florida Constitution. And by the way, I was around in, in the legislature in 1901 when this law was passed, and it was never intended to be applied to the white population. Of and course. it was intended to be enforced against uh, rural black people primarily. Yeah, it's very typical of that era of, of gun control laws in the South. Yeah. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. That's that's not uh, yeah. unfortunately an uncommon thing. But right. But so I, oh, wait, I, I just want to add, add one thing to that. Mm -hmm. The fact that they discriminated against black people doesn't mean that that's the only people the legislature didn't like. Sure. You know, for example, in, in Tennessee and Arkansas, when you say the only handguns you can have are the best and, and you know costliest ones, you're not. Of course, you're disarming black people because they're as former slaves, most of them are pretty poor, but you're also preventing poor white people from buying new handguns. And, you know, the legislatures thought that was swell too. I mean, they were uh, suspicious, not only of the black population, but of uh, a lot of the, the poor white population as well. Sure, certainly. But so I guess the core argument though, is essentially that uh, there really aren't good analogies for these types of modern assault weapons bans. In, in the relevant history, not that, not for right? possession, not for sales and possession bans. Okay, you know to say you don't you, you uh, limitations on carry, uh, limitations on sales to minors, extra punishment for use in a crime, things like that. Those are very straightforward, and maybe right. there are some other controls you could, could argue for, uh, but not not outright prohibitions. Right, and that's the big that's the big problem because even if you. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of this logic along the way, you could question each part of it. But even if you agree that, for instance, mass shootings are a modern uh, problem that didn't exist at the founding and they're yeah. facilitated by uh, they're something created or facilitated by modern firearms technology. I mean, all that is obviously questionable in and of itself. But even if you agree with that, you'd still have to find analogies that are uh, a good match for both the how and why. And, and right. from what you're saying here. Those just don't exist. Right. And, and, and by the way, according to the Congressional Research Service in a 2015 study, uh, under 10 percent of mass shootings uh, involve so-called assault weapons. Hmm. You know, and uh, yeah, that, I guess it depends like on how hear, you... you'll hear from the gun ban lobbies. But that's that's what the, the Congressional Research Service said. I guess it depends on how you define it, right? Um, well, they, which is they, another big question. Well, they're, right. Then there's there's all always attempts to expand uh the category so people can say oh we have a mass we have a mass shooting every day in the united states which by which sure. they mean there was a gun crime in which three people were injured so you know somebody robbed a liquor store and uh shot and wounded uh the clerk and two customers they'll they'll call that a mass shooting although yeah, that's not usually what, for what we well the, the yeah depends the, it really depends it, on it, it depends because there there is no definition but anyway calculate, yeah. congressional research service found for what it called mass shootings, um, under 10 percent 
involve a, a so-called assault weapon. And if you narrow it to just public mass shootings, which is you know sort of how we, we think of it more commonly, uh, mm -hmm. then it's uh, 27%. So it's still the, the mm -hmm. vast majority uh, do not involve uh, these particular guns that people want to ban them. Yeah, the, the certainly the the violence project count, which is the one I find most uh, reliable and detailed, and which uses the CRS uh, definition. And certainly, I think there's broad based agreement that handguns are the most commonly used, even in mass shootings. Oh, by, by ARs far. are a little bit more frequently used in a mass shooting than they are in other types of crime, um, but. Regardless, uh, I think there's a general agreement. Obviously, a lot of this comes down to how you count or what definition you prefer. But yep. there's a general uh, agreement that they actually are not the most commonly used firearms in these incidents. Um, so, so your point stands on the, on there as well. Now, given, uh, I mean, it seems like uh, you know, obviously, your your view on these cases is that uh, these these sorts of bans are not constitutional, right? They're not compatible with the Second Amendment under the Bruin standard. So what's your practical outlook on how these are going to go? I mean, is the Supreme Court going to take a case next session and uh, declare assault weapons unconstitutional? Are they going to wait 10 years? Like, what do you, uh, how, how do you see things going at this point? Are, are assault weapons bans on the chopping block now? Uh, I think we're going to find it'll continue to be like it's it's been so far with mixed results in the federal district courts. You know, some will uphold them, some will some will not. Um, and then it goes up to the courts of appeals and we may may get mixed results uh, from them as well. Um, you know, there, there's currently a case where uh, as we speak, the uh, a, a suit against uh, the city of Naperville's uh, Illinois assault weapons ban was done, you know, in the same style as the Delaware case we were talking about. Is like you come into court, here's your verbal formulation, therefore give me a preliminary injunction. The other side comes in with all this evidence, and the court says, "Well, I, I don't, you know, that, that these laws are probably constitutional based on all the evidence we've seen from the other side and kind of the." Uh, narrow versus the narrow, but I think correct, uh, but still narrow argument on uh, by the plaintiffs. And mm -hmm. then rather than just saying, okay, fine, we didn't get the preliminary injunction, let's go through discovery and we'll we'll develop more evidence on, on our side. It's they, they ran to the Seventh Circuit and said, give us a preliminary injunction uh, pending appeal. And the Seventh Circuit just simply said no, because uh, Again, a preliminary injunction is an extraordinary remedy where you've got to show, that, you, among other things, uh, that you're very likely to win the case on the merits. And so right. then the next thing, uh, the the Naperville plaintiffs uh, now filed in the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, and said, give us a preliminary injunction pending appeal, which I, it's it's not impossible to get one of those, but I think it's it's quite unlikely. unlikely. Okay. Because the, the Supreme Court tries to get cases mm -hmm. where everything is fully developed. Yeah. So do you, so you see something like the Fourth Circuit case or the Ninth Circuit case, uh, Miller in, in California, those being the more likely cases to end up at the Supreme Court eventually? Well, yeah, the, the Fourth Circuit case especially. I think it's Bianchi mm -hmm. versus Frosch yeah. because it's in the Fourth Circuit already. What What all the other circuits did was when the Supreme Court uh, – came out with Bruin and granted, vacated, and remanded some cases, uh, the, the circuit courts in, gen in general uh, not only sent those cases back to the U.S. District Court, they took a lot of the other gun control uh, mm -hmm. cases that were before them and said, oh, look, go back, go back to district court, go, yeah. go redo this case under the Bruin standard, and we'll, we'll take a, a look at it. Then. Right, which adds, a, I mean, maybe a couple of years to that process. Yeah, right? absolutely. And so uh, I won't, we won't hold you to this, but I, what's your timetable guess as to when an assault weapons ban case is actually going to make it to SCOTUS? You mean, to, well, I mean, you, you can, anybody can file a cert petition anytime. So right. But when do you think they might actually take one up? Shirari, Yeah. Um, at least a year, maybe more. Okay. Um, I mean, that's still I, pretty quick and 
Supreme Court it, terms, right? It is, and I mean, it, 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 and definitely uh, the, the maybe more uh, I said is, is doing a lot of work here. Mm. Uh, I, I think the more <laughs> likely thing for them to want to take is these uh, massive resistance uh, to the broom, broom response bills. Direct, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, New York and uh, because New York's already had had oral argument in the Second Circuit right. uh, on that, so that's in, in fairly good shape uh, to move forward. And those are much easier cases because it, the, they're not fact dependent. Yeah. You know, if, if assault weapons, so called, really did were were super powerful compared to other firearms, that would inevitably that that might change the result. Who knows? But mm -hmm. there's at least that dispute going on about them, uh, yeah. which is a factual matter. And, you know, how often supposedly, uh, you know, how often are they used for self-defense? That's not something that Heller ever required to be shown. I mean, uh, uh, Heller pointed out that handguns are possessed for self-defense. They didn't get into any data about how often people pull the trigger. But that, right. you know, that comes up in the assault weapon cases. But in contrast, to get back to the main point, for the, the anti-carry bills enacted in New York and New Jersey, and to a lesser extent in Maryland, there's nothing really to argue about factually. They're not arguing to, it's not about carrying special guns. It's just about whatever handguns happen to be legal in the particular state. And it's really questions, well, where can you ban licensed carry? Mm -hmm. And on that, you're going to look at historical analogies. We know all the, you know, the, the, the laws right. are well known. And so, and the an court analogy, just looked at this, right? Yeah, it is so. or is or is not convincing. You know, can you, can you ban them at zoos? Well, Heller said you can ban guns at, at uh, yeah. schools, schools, government and, buildings, and right. sensitive places like that. So, is is a zoo like a kind of like a school because it's got a lot of kids? Well, you, you know, you can argue for or against that, mm -hmm. and you can also look at the history of municipal gun bans in like, say, Central Park in New York, which sure. had his movement in it. Um, it. It's all a very straightforward thing that you can just do. It's, it's so, a case you can do on paper with. So you think those are the those are one of the more likely ones to get taken next. What about, uh, yeah. do you see the, for instance, the, the Fifth Circuit case uh, on domestic violence restraining orders? Since that's a federal law that got struck down. Yeah. Do you think that maybe is even a higher priority for the court? Um, I'm not sure any of them want to have it as a priority, but you're right. When a when a federal statute is is struck down, that's uh, it's not a guarantee of a cert grant, but it mm. it's, it certainly uh, moves the odds in one's favor. You know, the yeah. interesting thing is, I mean, it's as a federal law, it's it's very rarely used. I mean, the laws yeah. against gun possession by uh, people under civil restraining orders. Uh, get a lot of enforcement in, in state courts, but usually these, these kinds of cases, um, you might, I think you might have a couple dozen of them in a yeah. year. At, at most. It's a weird case too, because that guy's, oh, that guy's likely to be convicted of a bunch of different felonies. So he's going to lose his gun rights anyway. Um, <laughs> he is very plainly a guy who shouldn't have a gun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is no question on that. So it's um, kind of strange that this case even got this far without him getting, you know, uh, convicted of some some of these crimes. He's been accused of like five different felonies for right, a right. bunch of different things he's done. Um, yeah. So, you know, well, but, that, that's, uh, why, yeah. that's why the Biden Department of Justice uh, did the cert petition because they, you know, they recognize yeah. that they don't want to bring mainstream Second Amendment uh, people into before this current Supreme Court. Uh, yeah. Because the, the court happens to, uh, you know, respect uh, the second yeah, this, amendment. And this guy's not a model plaintiff, that's for no, sure. No, he's, he's, I think this was a public or, defender case, right? So oh, yeah. he's sort of a wild card situation. Certainly not something that gun rights movement was actively seeking out in this case. Well, and, and that that's a long term um, tension in yeah. in all kinds of constitutional litigations. Because on your right, you have the public defenders who have that's their job is to, mm -hmm. as of any criminal defense lawyer is you zealously represent your client, you do the best you can, and you make whatever arguments you can think of versus the strategic point of, well, if you're trying to get get courts to enforce the Second Amendment, 
how about showing them some nice people uh, <laughs> right. who want to do it? And and this goes back to the reason Bob Levy. Uh, Not that the, it should matter, but it certainly does. Uh, but right? it does. And that, that that's why the, the Heller case began um, with a lot of disagreement about it within the pro Second Amendment lawyer community. But Bob Levy's and Alan Gura's argument is: Look, if we don't do this, the then the case is going to be you know United States versus so and so of some scuzzy defendant, and we'd rather have the Second Amendment presented uh, by decent law abiding plaintiffs that every reasonable person. Uh, would agree ought to be able to have a handgun in their home for protection. Yeah. I mean, that's what Miller was, right? It was, uh, there were some mobsters, right? That got arrested. Um, for I mean, yeah. They, they, the S- they were SBS. bootleggers and it, that, yeah. that was a, uh, and there's actually the law review article about that case, which is cited in the, uh, by Heller, uh, mm-hmm. the strange case of United States versus Miller. It was a setup. Uh, yeah. The federal district judge was a gun control advocate and wrote a two paragraph opinion with no reasoning in it saying that the federal tax and registration on, on short barrel shotguns violated the Second Amendment. Hmm. Uh, the case went straight to the Supreme Court because it, it could in those days. Um, right. And the lawyer for the defendants didn't even file a brief. Didn't, he just yeah, sent a letter to the court it. saying re- rely on the government's brief in this case. Yeah, pretty, so, pretty. There's a whole fascinating history there that we don't have time to get into, unfortunately. Yeah. But, but we do appreciate you coming on and, and giving us an overview of uh, – the landscape on so you know so-called assault weapons bans and both the the political aspect in Colorado and then the legal aspect nationwide and and I think we've got a lot of really good information today so I, I really appreciate it. Uh, can you tell people where they can find more from you uh, if if they want to follow your Dave, work? DaveCopel.org, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L dot org is my website and I'm also on Twitter um, at at Dave Copel. All is one word: D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L. Fantastic. Now we're we're actually going to head over now to uh, an, uh, Jake Fogelman, who is a contributing writer at the Reliving. He's also an analyst at Independence Institute with you. So, um, hopefully, yeah, Jake was a great intern in 2020, and now he's uh, does a lot of writing for us on uh, on energy policy. On and energy, energy, yes, yes, exactly. But uh, there's that connection, that shared connection. So. Yes. Um, we're going to head over and talk to him about what the, the latest in news is right now. So, all right. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Here we are with Jake, uh, who uh, we just finished talking to, to one of your colleagues or one of your higher ups, I guess, at Independence Institute, Dave Copel. So uh, <laughs> uh, he said that he, he said that you're doing a great job in the energy section in your the other writing that you do but outside of the reload. So uh, congratulations on that point. I guess. Yeah, thank you. It's an Independence <laughs> Institute takeover of the reload this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously your work there doesn't affect your work here because it's on two completely different topics. But, right. but uh, it's good to disclose anything anyway. Don't want people to, uh, to, to find out and then think that we were hiding something, right? But, right. Um, uh, so yeah, how how have you been? How how uh, how's your weekend? How was how's your week gone since we talked last? Uh, it's been good. Been keeping me busy here. Speaking of the Independence Institute, I'm working on a, a big report right now, so I've kind of been you know nose to the grindstone, typing mm-hmm. out this big long long report in between writing stories for the reload. So that's how it's gone for me. Well, what about yourself? How's your week been? Uh, pretty good. You know, I, I was on CNN a couple of times. This week, uh, dealing with, um, you know, a couple of days, there was the active shooter report from the FBI came out this week that had some interesting tidbits in it. I think we'll, we'll link that in the uh, the newsletter this week as well, um, just to give, you know, it, uh, incidents are actually down from 20, uh, so it's last year's report, it's 2022 report, incidents were down from 2021, the number of them, but the casualty uh, count was up. Uh, I think that's just sort of the result of the you know random chance, frankly, because I don't think it's not as though guns got any deadlier between 2021 and 2022. The trend is frankly, um, you know, a positive trend in the sense that there are fewer of the incidents. It's, it seems to match with um, the murder rate uh, fairly closely, which is kind of interesting to me uh, because, you know, Incidents were still significantly up from pre-pandemic levels, 2018, 
Like they're up like 67%, the number of incidents, which is really bad, obviously. Same for the murder rate, right? It's it's way up compared to uh, 2018, 2017. But, uh, but at the same time, it has receded a bit from the high levels that we saw uh, in 2020, 2021. Uh, so it's a positive trend back towards where we used to be, but one that still is cause for significant concern, right? Uh, and so that that's what I was talking to, to CNN about uh, earlier this week. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, in, in personal news beyond the uh, sort of my, my other, my other second job, <laughs> um, uh, I actually did pull the trigger, so to speak, on buying a, uh, a six hour P365 X macro. And I got the one that has uh, the integrated red dot or it comes from the factory with a Romeo zero elites and, and a little metal shield for anyone watching on YouTube. Here's what it looks like. The macro is different in that it has one, an integrated, um, uh, compensator that helps keep the recoil impulse flatter. And it also holds 17 rounds, uh, which was the main reason that I decided to finally make this switch from my, Springfield XDS, which holds eight rounds. <laughs> um, so pretty big, pretty big upgrade on that front, more than double the ammunition and really a very similarly sized gun. It's slightly, it's a bit bigger than the XDS, but I figure I have the, uh, the body to where I can conceal a bigger gun. It's not, it's still much smaller than, you know, any sort of full size firearm out there. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've taken it to the range. It shoots great. Uh, although this site, uh, and there's no one behind my camera for anyone watching on, on, uh, on YouTube, as I, uh, point the, the gun at the camera, uh, the one funny thing about this site is that when I went to zero it, um, and this wasn't the greatest process for zeroing, uh, cause I was doing it from a standing position and you should really just do it from a bench rest so you can avoid uh, inputting any arrows of your own into the shooting. But I, I was kept hitting low into the left, which sort of gaslit me into thinking that the problem was my shooting and that I was just flinching uh, and not the sight. And so it took a while to get past that, that, that sort of gaslighting because I was like, there's no way I'm flinching this consistently that it's hitting in this tight group down <laughs> uh, and to the left. So, and then I, as I adjusted the site, it, it got much closer to where, to my actual aim point. So I think, uh, yes, that <laughs> the issue was for one of the only times in history, the down and to the left uh, hits were, were actually the result of the site. <laughs> Gun guys rejoice. It was the gear. It wasn't the shooter. <laughs> <laughs> the one that, it took me a while to be like, no, actually, I think it is the site that's causing this. <laughs> I was sort of really pissed at myself. I was like, geez, how am I shooting this gun so bad? How am I flinching that much? I, so I was shooting like the 365. I have a regular 365, and I wasn't having the flinching issue with that. And I was shooting the XDS and wasn't having issues with that. And then I kept hitting low and left. And I was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm doing so bad with this gun. What's wrong with me? Why am I flinching? And, uh, and I wasn't actually flinching. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the site kind of gaslit me a little bit on that front, but otherwise very happy so far. Have you shot the, the macro yet? I have not. Uh, so all my, I'm not a SIG guy personally, but all my friends that I go shooting mm -hmm. with are all SIG guys and they're all pining to go buy one because they, they want to add it to their collection of SIG. So I haven't had a chance yet. It wasn't yet, cheap. I'll but say I have that a feeling much. soon. Yeah, you should try it. It's nice. It shoots great for the size that it is. And I do think the compensator makes a, a bit of a difference in uh you know controllability of the gun and uh i will say it's not it's not cheap with the at least the version that comes with the red dot from the factory was uh it was a thousand bucks at my local store so uh not not the cheapest carry gun <laughs> well, not the most expensive either certainly right you know it's not a shadow systems or a or staccato <laughs> staccato yeah uh which you know all great brands as far as as far as i've seen but not not budget brands that's for sure um and the other the other downside i had is that i bought this um so I, i've carried an alien gear 
I know people, there will be holster snobs that don't like this, but <laughs> I've car carried an Alien Gear hybrid holster forever. I started off with the old uh, leather hybrid holsters and uh, when I was young and dumb and, and didn't know any better because uh, they're very comfortable for anyone who's ever carried with one knows. Now, the big problem with a leather hybrid holster is that they don't actually retain the gun very well. Like, uh, you know, they don't snap in like they would with a Kydex holster. However, and I know that anyone watching thinks that this looks exactly like a leather hybrid holster. The difference is that this, this version, this is their 3.5 cloak tuck or, or whatever. And uh, it has a metal plate in the built into the backing of this this hybrid holster. And so when you put a gun in there, it actually does retain it. So you can have a fully loaded gun and turn it upside down and it's not going to fall out. Um, and it does all the things that, that it's supposed to do for um, a good holster in the act of self-protection, uh, good holster video. If people go and watch that, which I highly recommend. So you, you want your holsters to be safe. You want them to cover the trigger guard completely. You want them to retain the gun. You know, th there's, uh, some tests you should do to make sure that your gun is is uh, is properly that your holster really is is quality enough for for what you're trying to do. One of the tests is that it, it should fit in to the holster, and this does not. <laughs> uh, That's one of the big downsides. Uh, the, the problem with the Zalian gear holster is that even though it has a little notch for the uh, for a red dot sight. It's not big enough for the one that comes standard on the gun because they. I think part of it is that Sig puts their little metal shield on the the uh, the Romeo Elite from the factory, and so when I try to put it in this Alien Gear holster, it just it won't go. So I have to reach out to them and see if maybe the, they fix that issue and they can send me a new Kydex or. Uh, or what the deal is if maybe they just don't make one that uh, that'll accommodate the shield over top of the the um, the micro dot but and I might just you know do a little self modification and cut out this plastic piece that's blocking from fitting in there I've also I've ordered a more traditional uh, the, what's the, all the rage now is of course appendix carry holsters I think you appendix carry right that's right yeah. This, this is the thing that everybody does. I'll these say days. I got my pendix yeah, right here. <laughs> so, um, you know, for, for me, I never got into appendix. I don't know that it would be comfortable enough for me to actually do it. Maybe I'll try it. I, I did order, you know, a, a relatively cheap, but looks like a quality holster off Amazon. Um, so I'll, I'll have the option to at least try it out. And at least I'll have a holster. <laughs> Um, so I can start because a lot of those, those appendix holsters, you can still carry, um, you know, strong side if you want yep. to. Uh, I think they're not they're not as comfortable as this sort of uh, two clip design that Alien Gear uses. Uh, there is there are some other companies out there. I think Tier One is another one I've looked at for a, a double clip strong side holster. I might switch to them if I can't get the Alien Gear set up to work for me. I don't know. It's nice to at least have an excuse now to experiment with holsters because I've been using the same gun and holster for really too long. Uh, you know, I let it get, you know, the, that XDS, Springfield XDS, nice gun. It still shoots great, but technology has advanced quite a bit since, since that gun came out. And now I can carry a 17 round magazine in a pretty similar uh, footprint. So I've, I have now upgraded. I'm with, the modern times uh, in my carry setup. <laughs> the future is now. <laughs> and so maybe I'll, maybe I'll get forced into the appendix carry like everybody else too. We'll see. <laughs> but um, maybe I'll get an enigma and do go that direction. There you go. We'll see. Uh, that way uh, that that's an enticing offering too. You don't, you don't even need a belt for that. Right. That, that sort of rig. I like that concept too. You can carry in sweatpants and stuff. But uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> let's get let's get going to the the news of the day. We've, we've gone through our personal updates and our new new toy, our new gun, our new uh, new concealed carry firearm. It does shoot well, um, in, in so far. I mean, I'll probably put a couple hundred more rounds through it before I really rely on because that was my problem. I bought, I tried to upgrade, 
a couple of years back, right? When this this trend of the micro nines with massive capacity started with the three six, the original three six five, and I bought one of those, one of the first runs. It was June of the year that it came out, and if people Uh-oh. remember that period yeah. of time, the three six five had issues when it first launched. Basically, like every gun, the, the XDS had issues when it first launched. The Shield had issues when it first launched. Um, it takes a little time for these companies to sort of iron out the kinks in some of these things. Uh, like the this 365 had issues with light primer strikes was the problem. And if you're relying on that gun to, um, you know, to, to, for self-defense, light primer strikes, that's a big deal. Because <laughs> if the gun doesn't fire when you pull the trigger, uh, yeah, you might die, right? That's the whole, right. the whole idea. So... Uh, I could never, I could never get comfortable carrying that gun because every. Uh, eventually, I did get it fixed. Eventually, Sig replaced the whole striker assembly. I think I had to do that like twice. I had to send it back to them. They, I did it once myself. Then I sent it to them. They did it, and it seems to be operating fine now. But yeah, uh, that was my last time where I tried to, you know, uh, tried to keep up with with the, the modern carry movement and uh it didn't work out so i've just stayed with the old reliable xds which i never had a problem with uh but now you know so i'll have to test this new 365 pretty thoroughly before i actually carry it but i haven't seen anything where people are reporting significant issues with it so that's a good sign sounds like it was a successful upgrade then (laughs) hopefully so what do we got uh news wise though yeah, so news of the week, we have uh, out of Delaware, there's a bill circulating through the legislature right now to institute a permit to purchase scheme for pistols, uh, mm-hmm. similar to this sort of system that uh, North Carolina actually just repealed. This was on yeah. the table, I guess, previously, but they, they brought it back this session. So that's moving its way through there. Yeah, uh, uh, that- actually, on real quick on that one, um, I think that's an area where because uh, well, Oregon just implemented that as well, right? That was part of the Via ballot measure, yeah. The ballot measure. And uh, what I remember from the initial preliminary injunction being denied on that on that point in federal court, the judge just cited um, the concurrence in Bruin that said essentially concealed carry permits uh, are okay as long as they are uh, you know, shall issue as long as it's not an arbitrary system or, uh, or, you know, like you could be denied for no reason at all, essentially. Uh, and so it does imply maybe that permit to purchase laws are, are equally justifiable under that same logic because the Supreme Court has now, you know, I didn't used to think this, but the, now this, the court has put carry and uh, ownership on essentially the same level. And so if permitting is allowed for carry, it stands to reason that they might allow it for purchase as well. Uh, so that's one interesting thing to me, because most, I think most people, you look at the Bruin standard, you look at the Bruin case, and it's, you're mainly thinking of all the things that it likely will not allow, all the laws that are likely to be struck down in the wake of it. Uh, like we were just talked about with, with, uh, Dave Copel, assault weapons bans seem seem hard to justify under this standard. But one area that uh, perhaps you might see expansion is these these sort of uh, permits purchase laws. Yeah, we'll have to see if that if that bill makes it through. I'm sure it'll be sued in court almost immediately, as a lot of these bills do, and it'll Probably. be a good chance to to test that. Of course, that'll uh, come down to the circumstances too, right? Like if if it's just used to deny people wholesale the ability to buy guns, then it's probably not going to stand right. up in court. But but if it's just a similar system to a shall issue concealed carry permitting process, it probably has a better chance. And then we also have another story out of the Associated Press. So Washington officially signed, the governor of Washington officially signed their new assault weapon ban into law. And as soon as the ink was dry, the Firearms Policy Coalition and the Second Amendment Foundation filed a lawsuit against that. So it's already the first mm-hmm. federal court challenge against that uh, new gun ban out there in Washington. Yep. I think the NRA has one as well. They might be involved in the same one, actually. I think they uh, them they helped the suit from the NSSF that's also suing that ban, as well as a liability law that was attached to sort of this gun control package in Washington. Yeah, right. So there's going to be a lot of litigation over that for sure. And then along the same lines, uh, Vice actually had a story about 
the aftermath of Washington's assault weapon ban, where apparently left wing gun owners are voicing concern that because now they don't have the opportunity to purchase, quote unquote, assault weapons anymore, they think that only right wingers in the state have assault weapons. And I guess this is sort of an unintended consequences story of, you know, how these bans go among people that you don't really expect to be opposed to these political actions. Yeah, you saw you saw a lot of that with Oregon as well, where there are a lot of uh, left leaning activists complaining about that wall because it's most likely to be enforced against um, you know minorities and the less fortunate. So that's right. And then uh, finally, we have the Montana governor. This comes from the Bozeman Chronicle. Uh, the governor Greg Gianforte just signed a bill, basically in, along the same lines of the Texas model, where it prevents the state from doing business with any financial institution that discriminates against the firearms industry in any way. So mm -hmm. this is a continuation of a trend we've been following. Yeah. Florida is considering that same bill, right? The governor that's DeSantis right. wants, wants a bill just like that as well. And a handful of other red states as well. So that's sort of the new frontier and mm -hmm. trying to crack down on, on woke companies or whatever. Yeah. Probably the next, next big trend in red state uh, gun regulation, I would think. And then finally, uh, for our new segment, for a story that I wrote, um, we have a big ruling out of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. We have officially another bump stock ruling where a judge found that the ATF doesn't have the authority to impose that ban. If, you know, listeners will remember President Trump instituted this ban in the aftermath of the Las Vegas shooting in 2017. The ban went into effect in 2018, and it essentially changed the way the ATF classifies bump stocks, where previously they had said that they're A-OK, -okay, and now they declare them machine guns, essentially. So machine guns, mm -hmm. for those who don't know, are federally prohibited, uh, especially those manufactured after 1986. And so folks and that have these... A, yeah, you need to... You need to reg yeah, they have to be registered for you to be able to possess them. Right. right? And that was the and big I issue in that case because they didn't... Oh, this is one area where this the bump stock ban is a little bit different from the more recent... Uh, executive orders or rule changes that the Biden administration has put in place, which uh, the bump stock ban did not allow you to uh, register the bump stocks, even if you right. wanted to. Uh, so they basically all became illegal overnight to possess um, for anyone who had them. It didn't, you know, it, technically they they became, they, they were sort of backdated NFA items by the way this rule was put into place. Right. Yeah. It was, e it was either confiscate, confiscation, destroy them or face a uh, possible 10 year jail sentence. And so this is what yeah. this case happened. This, this gentleman was a Kentucky man who owned bump stocks prior to the ban, had to get rid of them, obviously, when the ban was handed down and he sued. Um, and, you know, just uh, to show you how long this litigation takes, this was back in 2019 when he first sued. And we finally have a court of appeals ruling in 2023. But yep. basically, the, the judge in this case a little bit different than the Fifth Circuit ruling that we covered earlier this year, where they also struck down the bump stock ban. In this case, the judge made no affirmative ruling one way or the other, whether or not a bump stock can be classified as a machine gun. He mm -hmm. essentially said reasonable minds can differ. But because it's so unclear whether or not it actually is a machine gun, uh, he, is, he followed what's called the rule of lenity, which says whenever there's ambiguity in a criminal law, then the defendant, you, you know, tie goes to the runner, essentially the defendant comes out on top. And that's how this one was decided. Yeah, yeah, there was a three judge panel and the the they it was a unanimous ruling, right? Yep, three zero. Although and, a I'd say the concurrence was wanted to go a little bit further than the other ju judges were willing to go. He was more right. aligned akin with the fifth circuit where he said, I, I think it's pretty clear that this doesn't meet the textual definition of a, a machine gun. But either way, it's the same outcome. Right, because the 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 core problem with the ATF's rule is that there's a pretty specific definition of machine gun in federal law, which is that uh, any firearm that fires more than one round per trigger press is a machine gun. This is using automatic fire, right? So if you pull the trigger once and you get multiple rounds, it doesn't matter if it's uh, two, three rounds or two rounds, you know, it, it burst fire or fully automatic or whatever, as long as that trigger depression fires more than one round, then it's considered automatic fire. And then obviously semi-automatic is if each time you pull the trigger, you get one round. And so you have to pull the trigger every time you want to fire a round. And the, the issue is that bump stocks, and this one is just a fact, it was really not even a matter of opinion. Bump stocks do not uh, cause the firearm to uh, fire more than one round per trigger pull. All it does, it really, 
all it does is facilitate a style of shooting. You can bump fire without a bump stock, right? Uh, you can uh, use, it's essentially just using the recoil of the gun to reset the trigger much more quickly than you could by physically squeezing your trigger and letting go. Uh, so a bump stock just allows you to depress the trigger much faster than you otherwise would be able to, but you're still having to pull the trigger or depress the trigger or have a function of the trigger every time you fire around. And that's, that's sort of the big problem with the ATF's redefinition of these devices from literally just stocks that don't, aren't regulated at all. You know, they're not firearms. They're it's literally just a piece of plastic. It's a stock. And um, they moved that to a machine gun. <laughs> right. Um, and the, the part itself is a machine gun. And so, you know, that's that's the core of this. And, yeah, the, the, it's interesting in this case, they just didn't want to, I guess the, the two of the three judges didn't want to make a determination about the facts of the matter because there have been other courts that have determined it is a machine gun and that the regulation is fine. But... Um, they yeah they, it came it still came down to what was at the core of the the Fifth Circuit case too which was the rule of lenity right the, the ATF right. previously said this now they're saying this and it's a totally different thing and it's the law itself is not necessarily obviously on the side of the new rule that the ATF has put down and so because even the ATF can't figure out whether this thing's a machine gun people shouldn't be prosecuted under the understanding that it is a machine gun, because how could they know if the ATF right. doesn't even know? That's sort right. of the base. Put it in in simpler terms. That's what they're ruling. And uh, the the issue with that, um, there are the implication for that beyond the bump stock rule, is that these other recent rules m may suffer from this same defect. Right there, the bump stock ban kind of laid the groundwork for what. President Biden has done with the ghost gun ban, so-called ghost gun ban, right? And and the ban on pistol braces um, or pistol braced guns, at least. And I think there, those rules are just as susceptible to this exact kind of reasoning as the bump stock ban is. Right. And that, that's going to be the real implications. I was say where, yeah, we have a, an actual history of the ATF issuing determination letters saying, oh, these are fine. You know, you're not in violation of any any laws if you want to possess these and use these. And then mm -hmm. something happens, some you know, public event happens, the president changes and all of a sudden actually they're NFA items and you, <laughs> right. it, you could go to jail. So, yeah, I agree that the logic jail, is federal there. Federal jail for 10 years. That's right. Up to 10 years in federal prison. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. it's not a slap on the wrist by any means. And it's also just a, an interesting thing to note with the bump stock ban is now we have two federal appeals courts coming down and saying that this ban doesn't fly. But, you know, a couple of years back, we had a string of at least three other federal appeals courts that said that it was fine. And you have to wonder now, does the Supreme Court look at the situation and say, well, it's untenable to have half the country say it's one way and half the country say it's the other way. And you have yep. to wonder, if, is this the next big case they might take? And, you know, the Biden administration has already appealed that Fifth Circuit ruling that we talked about. So it could very well be the next gun case, even though it's not a Second Amendment case. It's more of an administrative law case, but it could be the yeah. next gun case. That is one of the fascinating things about this whole ordeal as well, because these rulings don't deal with the Second Amendment. They don't even deal with the recent EPA ruling about the limits of uh, agency power. Those those really weren't arguments at issue in these cases. And, and you still have the bump stock ban losing. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating. But, but yeah, I mean, I think... You're right about that circuit split could absolutely lead to uh, a Supreme Court case in the near future. Um, you know, we've just talked with uh, with Dave Koppel about some of the other potential, um, you know, front of the line cases for the Supreme Court to take on guns. Uh, this this could, should probably be in that conversation as well, somewhere in there, because you're, you're already at the circuit level for these cases. Uh, you're already at the appeals court level. You know, this is I think the Fifth Circuit bomb stock case has that gone to the full court yet i can't recall. yeah that one was an en banc decision uh the yeah, sixth circuit so, one was not but the fifth circuit right one the sixth was. circuit's a panel but the fifth circuit was on banc and yeah i mean if the if doj is appealing appealing that the next stop is the supreme court so uh this could be this could be the next one of the next ones it could be the next one we, I mean, this is another is issue where federal law is implicated 
and struck down in these cases, sort of, sort of. I mean, it's rulemaking, but um, but DOJ wants the court to take that, and they they usually get preference in the yeah. you know the court's going to hear the government's appeals before they hear uh, you know a private party appeal in a lot of cases. So uh, yeah, we will keep our eye on that for sure, and um, we will absolutely keep keep everybody updated on where these things go and what happens next at the, the Supreme court on, on gun policy. And uh, if you want to follow along with our reporting on these issues, you can head over to the reload.com and sign up for our free newsletter. You can buy a membership if you want to support the reporting that we're doing and get further insight into these cases through our analysis pieces. I think Jake is uh, planning to do one on this very topic. So uh, it's likely already published by the time that this, our podcast comes out here. Uh, and then, of course, you will get the podcast itself a day early, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions during our Q&A sessions. And you will also have the opportunity to appear on the show. If you're a member who wants to be on the show and do a member segment, just reach out, reply to your, your Sunday newsletter, which is another exclusive for members. Only members get the Sunday newsletter. And let us know, and we'll have you on. We'd love to have another, another member segment real soon here. But uh, that's it for this week. Uh, if you want to help us out, uh, you, but you don't want to spring for a membership, you can also rate and share this podcast. You can like it on Facebook. You can leave a review on whatever podcasting app you're listening to it on that will help us immensely as well. So uh, go ahead and do that. And we will be back again with you guys next week. No, the devil's got no.